because I've, I've never actually done this before. I've seen this image, I just haven't actually played with it myself. Yeah, Bunting Squares, it's a classic. There's a pattern that you get if you just XOR X and Y coordinates with each other. And then I think what you're seeing here is sort of a sweep through that pattern as you compare it to an increasing number. Yeah, a plot of cells satisfying bitwise XOR AB is less than N for consecutive values of N. Actually, like, what if we just XOR everything together? So XOR, the 8-bit version of X and Y and um, the frame counter. Let's make that a grayscale. You can imagine this is like a loop. It's not a loop because there is no flow control, but it's like we're going through a loop over 128 pixels, 64 from one line, 64 from another line. We're looping over those 128 pixels. For each of those pixels, we present the address of that pixel on the screen, so like the XY coordinate, and uh, pulse this begin pixel uh, signal. Then this does whatever it needs to do to get that pixel from memory or render it or whatever, get it from multiple places in memory. So like, for example, you could do like a tile-based graphics rendering engine that has a fetch for the background, a fetch for the sprites, and like some compositing. Um, and it could take a different amount of time for each pixel. Like a pixel that involves a bunch of sprites overlapping could take longer than a pixel that just has a background layer. But if you don't run out of time for the whole line, then the sprites don't become a problem. So like we could do like kind of a Game Boy or NES style graphics engine with a framework like this, where you don't have an entire frame buffer, but you're kind of synthesizing the graphics row by row. Um, I think the first stop here is to try to make the modulation here a little bit more camera friendly, just so that the rest of the stream is less flickery. Um, I've tried to make this easy to adapt to other geometries and wiring patterns of panels, because this general scheme is very common. Yeah, he's looking right at that robot. Oh, this cat is so great. I just, I just have to take a moment with this cat. Sorry. <laughs> There's the gradient demo and the waveform. Okay, so I'm triggering the scope on what, D3? Yeah, so D3 is a debug output, which I think I have attached to the begin frame pulse. So that's just one clock cycle at 30 megahertz. Yeah, so instead of just going from zero to 255 in this case, and then wrapping, we could divide this into two cycles where we go from zero to 255. And then on the second half of the cycle, we go from 255 down to zero. So one way to write this in logic would be this is going to look like writing C code, because the syntax in Verilog and C is very similar. But keep in mind, this is not code. This is logic. So what this is actually doing is taking this bit from the signal and wiring it up to a multiplexer that selects one signal or the other. And so in one signal, we'll be selecting an inverted version of that. So we could, we could do like a subtraction here. That might be nice. I'm going to keep it a little simpler and just actually negate the signal. So I think that'll give us something like a triangle wave. That is much nicer. Okay, I want to see the most significant bit on the bottom of the trace. I'm going to see if that makes the camera flickering any different. That's much better. I think this looks fairly stable on camera. And as long as I don't move my head too much, it looks good in real life. Seems to look all right on video. Inside this LED matrix 64 by 64 module, I added these two boxes to swap the scan order. These are the same, it's just that one of them is processing the address as we we're presenting it to the display, and one of them is processing the address as we we're um, filling that row of pixel memory with data. We were using these for numbers in the past, but the parameter could be like a file full of data, which could be a gamma ramp or a program or a sprite. Like when you're writing code in Verilog to simulate logic, it's useful to have input and output. And so you can you have like file IO in Verilog. It doesn't mean that you can make hardware that has file IO unless you build all of that up from scratch. But in this case, it's used at synthesis time to actually fill that memory with some data. 
how like how wide should the memory be if we wanted a gamma lookup table? Should we have three separate memories that are each eight bits wide? So we can gamma correct an entire pixel, red, green, and blue, in one clock cycle? Or should we have a single gamma lookup table that we use three times to correct each component? The latter is more space efficient. And we have certainly the time to spend three clock cycles per pixel gamma correcting them. Yeah, the triangle wave on the blue channel is much less distracting than the ramp wave. I'm just annoyed by having this 24-bit wide bus here. I think that interface kind of made sense in the kind of rendering module. So this clock cycle, we're transferring the value from the previous module into our GPU reg. Um, that's probably a good amount of work to do on this clock cycle. And then the very next clock cycle and like the very next three clock cycles we'll spend kind of working on each channel. I think we can just do uh, like write the code in Verilog, which would calculate the offsets here. And then it'll uh, like it'll just have to kind of evaluate this for all the combinations of channel, which is what we would have to do anyway if we were just writing this code out. And this would just generate multiplexers that would pick one of those three 8-bit lanes out of the 24-bit wide register. We could pipeline this more, but the simple thing to do would be to put this through the LUT right now. And so that's actually acting as a memory address to this lookup table, which is a little 8-bit wide memory. And that result would go into an output register. Okay, so we, we can only do one operation with this LUT per clock cycle. Um, if we tried to do more, then it just would not be able to map this to a RAM primitive, and it would try to implement it with a bunch of separate flip-flops, and it would make it like enormous. Probably wouldn't fit on the FPGA. If it did, it would just be really over large for what we're doing. So yeah, we want to just momentarily pulse done out at the same time that we kind of finish assembling this RGB out. On one clock cycle, begin in is pulsed, and it has a pixel on RGB in, which is a 24-bit wide bus. It stores that in this RGB store register, which it can then extract individual channels from using multiplexer here. It runs that through the lookup table here, which is a ROM that we fill in this initializer. The lookup table results go into one of the lanes of this set of latches, or this set of flip-flops here for the 24-bit RGB out register. So we're building this register up over three clock cycles, and then on the third clock cycle, we also pulse done out. So it's designed so the input and output interfaces are the same. So we can kind of chain this between the pixel shader here and the module here. Like one thing that this could do is have eight bits in and then like 12 bits out, and then the low couple bits would be um, be like time dithered. This looks right, but you see like they're really clustered up around around the low end, which is what I would expect, but can we make this 12-bit at least? bits is still not really enough to get at the low end for 2.2 gamma, huh? Well, maybe 12 bits is a good compromise. I mean, if you think about it, we're, we're like dividing the frame rate, and you can imagine that we have like a subtler kind of modulation that happens at a lower frame rate than the main modulation. We could also try a less extreme gamma here. That almost fits in 12 bits. It looks like 14 bits is enough for a gamma of 1.8. So yeah, this gives us six additional bits per channel, which we can tie to a frame-based modulation. So something that's like a frame-based pattern modulation that doesn't require any storage. So that'll be a dithering counter, um, which we're going to be comparing against the least significant six bits from the LUT, just to try to get the range back in the low end of the brightness. I think we're gonna need to keep kind of a pipeline of two stages here. So I'm thinking about one stage effectively for the RAM lookup, and then the next stage would be doing this kind of dithering decision. So I don't know if I wanna put all of those on the same clock cycle. So it's reading one of these stored components, red, green, or blue, depending on what state we're in. This is the last state. We're pulsing done momentarily. Um, for any other state, we're going to the next state immediately. And then clock cycle, like state two, is going to be the first state where we could have an output from passing that through the lookup table. 
So we've already got some sequencing for when a value is expected on RGB out. We're expected to have a value when done out is one, which is on state four. So that makes this a nine bit wide value. And then I add one to the least significant bit. If that does overflow, then I end up with a one in the most significant bit, which I check here. And then if so, then I saturate it to FF. If not, I return the original eight least significant bits. So this is, this is perhaps a dithering gamma correction module. This will map, if we're lucky, to a block RAM, which is pre-initialized with a particular bit pattern, and we're just not ever writing to it, so we're using it like a ROM. Um, and then this is just kind of a state machine sequencer. Um, this could be a little simpler maybe, but I don't know. It doesn't really do much. It's just like incrementing the state, and a couple of these values are special. Zero is idle, so it doesn't, doesn't increment when it's stuck in zero until begin in kicks it into the next state. And then four is where it wraps around. We're always sampling the input and storing it so that we just have a stable version of that, even if the previous module doesn't keep the value stable. And then this controls how we're doing lookups from the lookup table. So this case is generating an address for the ROM. So you can think of this as generating the address signal into the memory chip and then the output for the memory chip goes right into a, another set of flip-flops right here. And this is a multiplexer, which has values for one, two, and three, and other clock cycles we don't care, so the synthesizer can just do whatever is convenient here. And then this is the last bit down here. This is for taking the outputs of this, taking stuff that's been written into this 14-bit wide register, and using the low six bits of it as a dither control. Um, so this is like pulse width modulation. I'm expecting this dither counter is a frame counter that's just the low six bits of somebody's frame counter. Um, and then that optionally adds an extra least significant bit. So we'll, we'll try to test that out too. Dither counter is going to be a copy of some of the least significant bits of a frame counter that I already have. Right, um, that done out here. I'm going to debug that on the scope. That'll also go back to this rendering module. And the input is a multiplexer picking from one of these sets of flip-flops. Oh, it runs at 42 megahertz now. How did we manage that? Is that a problem? That sounds faster than I expected. Okay, just pasted it in. It seems to be the right length. I think that's the block RAM, because we had, I think, two block RAMs before. This looks very similar to the problem we had when we were stretching that start pulse. That doesn't look right. <laughs> so the red channel is at the bottom doing a, a, like a ramp. D7 should be a, like a really short done pulse, and that doesn't look right at all. So let's try to figure out what's going on there. That is without any diffuser, so you're seeing the LEDs pointed directly at the camera. They're just like very slightly warm. Oh yeah, I think I forgot to set done out to zero the clock cycle after I emit the pulse. Oh, that looks right. Whoa, and the color is much better. Oh, it looks really good in person. I didn't expect the gamma to be that big of a difference. Yeah, there's a lot more contrast. That's that's totally what we were going for. And then, okay, D7 looks more like I was expecting. So now you can kind of see how it's taking us longer to generate all the pixels now. You can look at the proportion of time where D7 is just all zero, that's idle time. So what we're looking at right now, D012 and D456, so that group of six lanes, those are the RGB values for the top and bottom of the panel. So I've got three buttons here which are acting like a counter with a reset up and down. And so I'm setting it to zero. And so the way it's set up right now, it's kind of pulse width modulating. I actually don't want quite pulse width modulation. I want something that's like pulse width modulation, but with the bits reversed. I think this is a form of pulse density modulation, which is what I'm getting, what I'm really trying to get at. And I could make it a real delta sigma modulator, but then I would need to store data between frames, which might be nice, but that's kind of outside the scope of this particular set of modules. Like, I don't know if that actually, that slow of a modulation is even useful. What I expect though is if I go to the next step, instead of sending a slightly wider pulse at the same rate, I expect it to double the rate. Yes, that's what I want. 
Okay, now we've got three pulses. Four pulses. Oh, this is much better. This is fading at a level of detail that's below one of the least significant bits in the binary code modulation. So it's again kind of a double-sided, like a two-layer modulation strategy, where we do this quick modulation that happens completely every frame the same way, reproducibly. And that's kind of the main like top tier modulation, but that gives us eight bits per channel. And then here I'm trying to get an extra six bits per channel by kind of cheating with time dithering per frame. So that's that's what we're doing. And I think this is working. Okay, this is the slowest modulation it knows how to do. And this is at an LSB of one. So going from an eight bit value of zero with gamma correction to an eight bit value of one with gamma correction gives you this like extremely subtle effect. And then a two. Should be three times that, that looks right. And then the next should be double this, so six. And then another three, so nine in the same time. So yeah, we're following the gamma table. E. And try doing a smooth ramp. That's pretty good. I, I kind of dig this, the two levels of modulation, I think. Because if I added extra bits to the binary code modulation, that would slow down the whole panel's refresh. But what this does is it gives me the ability to have a relatively slow kind of flickery refresh that only affects the least significant bit of the binary code modulation. And then the binary code modulation is all kind of as consistent as possible from frame to frame. Um, cool, well, let's clean this up a little bit and then add some more to it. So we have a frame counter over here, the manual counter with the button inputs over here. This is the main LED controller with the 64 by 64 addressing. Here's the gamma correction, um, which has an optional lookup table input. 